Hello everyone, Rob here. Welcome to another episode of Osborne Pro TV. Today I'm going to be showing you some things you can do to better secure your Apache server. Uh, so some of these may not apply to you depending on how your environment is. You can kind of determine uh, which works, uh, which security measures you want to apply to your instance. Uh, so just to get started here, what I have is I'm basically on a Kali machine here and right now I'm currently SSH'd in to a server on my home network which I use as a Nagio server which this is what that is here it's basically network monitoring and I have made a few modifications to secure the Apache instance it's running on I also have a an Apache instance running on a mint server and as you can see it's just showing the default Apache page and uh, this is able to get information from uh, basically on what's running on this server so if we check Wabalizer, we can see that there's different version information and such here, uh, which I'll get to again in a little bit. Um, alrighty, so if we are on currently, what we're going to start out with is uh, one of the things I, if you want to start from scratch here, I'll have these commands in the description of the video, but we are going to in order to do what I do here, you're going to need to have Apache 2 installed, Apache 2 Utilities installed, as well as the Security 2 module and the Evasive module. Uh, then once those are installed, you will need to enable them, which can be done using this command. And I'll have this in the description as well. And we're enabling SSL, headers, Security 2, SoCache, Unique ID, and Rewrite. And I'll kind of get to what those are. Um, one of the things I'll cover real quick since it's real simple is unique ID here is going to basically add a unique ID to your log files for all your requests. So if somebody makes a GET request to your web server, a unique ID gets assigned to that so you can find it easily again later. Um, Another thing I see often is the mention that you want to make sure Apache is running as a least privileged user. Typically, this is done by default nowadays whenever you install it and you don't really need to do this on your own. Um, another thing I see mentioned with that, for instance, is if I list uh, the Apache 2 configuration directory, which is Etsy Apache 2, it's owned by the root user. I've seen some people say that you should change the permission so that the www-data user or the Apache user, or HTTPD, would, whoever your Apache daemon is running as, uh, change the file permissions so that it's owned by that user. I don't suggest doing this and the reason for that is the root user is the only one who has permissions to write to the configuration files inside of this directory. Um, so if you change the owner it's going to be the root user and the www-data user so if that user is compromised through your website in some way the attacker can now modify your configuration files uh, which may, depending on how things are set up, lead to privilege escalation where they can take over the root user. Um, but that's basically why I would suggest not changing the owner of this. Leave it as root so you need to be, you need to have root permissions to modify these files. Uh, if you know better than me for some reason um, and you want to explain to me why uh, that is not the case or why it's ideal to change this root user to an Apache user, uh, feel free to leave that in the comments. So um, that is that part. Since I started talking about one of the other things we can cover real quick as well is uh, different HTTP methods. So you can use get request, post request, put, delete, or more so in um, uh, FTP servers, but they're also HTTP methods and there's also developer methods such as track and trace So one thing the trace method does is if I'm a developer I can use trace to uh, View a copy of the HTTP request so I can use the session header Possibly credentials to see to debug whatever is going wrong uh, with my communication in case there is something that, there's no need for that in a production environment, so we want to disable that. There's two ways to do it. We can use a rewrite rule, or we can just simply turn the trace enable value to off. Um, so uh, 
on my secure server here, since that's where that is. If I were to modify Apache 2 conf enabled security.conf and trace enabled, so I have it highlighted here, I have trace enabled turned off. If this is turned on, what can happen is if I'm an attacker, uh, which I'm over here now. So if I were to make a curl request, uh, let's say I do curl I, well, let's do a capital I, to, oh yeah, X, trace, HTTP, and uh, to war mint, dot Osborne Pro dot com. All right, and you can see I was able to successfully make that trace request, which means if <clears throat> any kind of authentication is performed and I'm an attacker, I could use that to possibly uh, set up my own XML HTTP server to, as well as many other ways, using the Act ActiveX tokens to steal um, authentication tokens to a site and compromise it. So we want to turn that off in non-production environments. And as you can see what this is going to look like on my server is if we make that request, we should get a 405, uh, 8080, and yeah, or a 403 forbidden. Let's out of curiosity, 403 forbidden. No, I thought 405, but 403 forbidden. So that's good enough for me. Um, so yeah, we don't want those requests being made and to the other way to determine that, right? So if we go to, I believe I have it set in my sites enabled, say zero default. Yeah. Another thing I'll mention here. So this is my rewrite module or we would do the command a to n mod rewrite, and that would enable the module if it's not already enabled. Um, but I have my rewrite rules at the top of my virtual host here. And the reason for that is when I put them more towards the bottom, they don't seem to get processed. So you want them at the top to ensure that the rules are applied. Um, but what I've done here, as you can see, we create a rewrite condition. Now let's make this visuals. And eh, not very good. All right, so if we create a rewrite condition where if it starts with trace or track or options that we uh, have it forbidden. So we have an F there for forbidden. So I guess that's why it was 403 and not 405. Um, <clears throat> so that's what's preventing those methods. I have a couple other rewrite conditions here, which I might as well cover now, I guess. Uh, so I have a rewrite condition for the server protocol. So if it starts with HTTP version 1.0, um, I wanted to forbid that as well, just because there's some vulnerabilities that come with that. HTTP version 1.1 is the first kind of standard, even though HTTP version 2.0 and 3.0 are out, uh, 1.1 is still uh, something you can use as those are more uh, we're not necessarily moved over to those other ones yet. So this 1.1 requests are fine to use. I don't have HTTP uh, version 0 0.9 in here because that I believe that request is not in the header. So if you check the RFCs for that on how HTTP version 0 0.9 works, uh, we're not able to perform a rewrite condition because that version's not in the header there. Uh, also, I've included uh, rewrite conditions for the user agent. So for example, we have wfuzz here, uh, as well as Python go fuzz faster you fool, which is the fuff tool and curl. And what that is doing is, oh, I forgot about that. Let's do one more request here. What that does is, uh, da -da. Forget if I'm using that correctly or not. It's been a while since I've changed the header. Yeah, so what those do basically is if in my request, there's the user agent is curl or Python or a fuzz tool, it blocks those requests. So right now, if I were to use wfuzz on HTTP for legion.osbornepro.com, come 8080 and fuzz here, user share uh, dear buster word list uh, directory uh, two dot 
a list of two, three. We'll go with medium just so it keeps sending stuff out. And uh, notice these are all 403s, and that's because the security module or the rewrite condition is blocking those and sending a 403 request on everything that's sent. And if I check my, let's do less var log Apache 2, <clears throat> maybe error log. All right, <clears throat> so if we check my error log, we can see for one, we have make sure this is the correct date too august 15th 122 yeah all right so that's all right uh, notice that the security module headers are blocking these requests for one <clears throat> my rewrite condition should also be rewriting it and let's see oops all righty oh i wanted to show the headers that's what i think it was All right, so you can see in my header, this is what I was trying to reference here. So we have a W fuzz in the header, and that's what our rewrite condition is sending that 403 to. So we have two different things blocking these requests, trying to discover possible web pages that exist on our site. Uh, so that's what that was all about there. Um, I didn't get to the version one. I, I got to the rewrite a little ahead of myself there. So I'm just checking my notes to make sure I covered uh, everything I want to and yeah so that all looks fine uh, another thing we're going to cover here is we'll go back up to my normal flow is the version info so anytime a request is made to a website if I inspect element here and we go to the network tab we'll refresh this and just to show you the headers here easily we have a server value that's saying, hey, this is an Apache server version 2.4.41 running on Ubuntu. And we don't want to give that away that kind of information because if I'm the bad guy, um, one of the things I can use as a tool such as Searchploit or of course Google is available as well, uh, where I can search Apache 2.4 and then I can get some possible exploits to use based on the version info. And of course these are all readily available if I wanted to view them, I could simply view a proof of concept by examining the file. And then I have uh, a tool to use right there. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why we don't want to give away that information. So there's two different ways to hide that information. By default, without the security two module that we have enabled, one of the things you can do is modify Apache 2, Apache2.conf. And down here where it says server tokens and server signature, notice it's on production and off. And what that is going to do is status Apache 2, CTL start Apache 2, just to kind of show you. So now if I do a curl to my local host, I should have just done the headers. So if I do a curl to my local host, I can see that now server, the only information I'm disclosing is Apache. There's no version info and there's no operating system info. Uh, however, we can limit that even more, as you'll see here, where if I request uh, my secured server at home, we can see I have my company name in that value. And this is so we can better hide uh, all the services that we're using kind of leave an attacker in the dark even after they've made some noise by making requests to our server so that's why we suggest doing this so in order to do that what we would have to do is for one we need to enable our security module which would be an a2 and mod security 2 once that's enabled what you would want to do is first modify your apache2.conf file and then server tokens, notice I have server tokens and server signature all commented out completely in this file. Once you've commented those out, you want to modify your Etsy Apache 2 conf enabled um, 
security.conf file. And then notice under my server tokens here that we have the server tokens value set to full. And then my server signature is where I can define uh, whatever I want there, which is where I put my company name. Um, and also this is where I have trace enable turned off. I try to set settings so that they're only in one of the configuration files and I try to do it in the one that makes sense or the one that makes the most sense to me anyway. So I have trace enable turned off in my security two module. Um, also notice I have my header value set here as well, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, another way an attacker can view that same information is if they were to go to just a random web page and generate an error message, they can also see that same server information down here. So as a way to help hide that, what I've done is I've created my own custom error pages that don't really tell you anything. So this is great for a production environment because that's all you really need to know. Anything else listed there is just uh, extraneous information, I would say. Uh, so I've set up those custom error pages by in my apache2.conf file and go towards the bottom of the page and you can see my error documents down here. And those are relative to your uh, Apache's um, home directory. So typically that's slash var slash www slash html. And then I have a 400.html document and one for all the other ones there as well. And to show you the contents of them, they're fairly simple. HTML slash 500. And that's basically all these are as a header in HTML tags. <clears throat> um, so uh, in older versions of Apache, I think you would still need to delete, uh, what do they call them? The, the default document files that come with it, which would used to be in user local Apache 2 HT docs. So you could delete everything in this directory. Uh, you could delete everything. And again, this is only in older versions, Apache 2 manual. And then uh, the user local Apache 2 CGI dash bin directory can also, you can delete the contents of those three if you're on an older version of Apache. Um, so those are good ways to hide your version. There's another thing out there uh, called e-tags, which if you have an e-commerce site, you can, uh, they, you're not PCI compliant unless you turn the e-tags off. Uh, really, I don't necessarily see too much of a reason for them. There's a couple vulnerabilities out there where an attacker is able to discover uh, inode metadata on different files. If you're not familiar with inodes, uh, metadata basically on the Linux file system. Uh, I know it's contained information about what files are on each one. So if I were to do something like uh, uh, stats Etsy pass WD, maybe it's stat. There we go. We can see my inode value is 529703, and it would an attacker would have access to this kind of data about a file. So we can see that the owner is root and all that fun stuff. So if we need to disable that, we would modify Etsy Apache 2, apache2.conf, and then e file etag. And you can see here, I have that value currently set to none. So that's how you turn that off to prevent any kind of vulnerabilities of information disclosure there. Uh, the next thing I have here is my headers, it looks like, so we'll cover those here. Now my headers, again, we're back in the uh, my security.conf file, which are in Apache 2, my configuration enabled, security.conf, and header. There we go. So if we visual, these are my header values I have set. So there's a couple reasons for these here. There is first, uh, we'll cover, okay, so there's the header. We're gonna edit and set our cookie. Basically, this refers to anything, anything that starts with this. Um, if, you know, and ends with any, a wild card, basically, that's what I was trying to get out. 
is going to have these values applied. So we're turning on the HTTP only cookie and that prevents JavaScript from doing um, JavaScript commands from being entered that are able to obtain information from your JavaScript document, such as grabbing uh, an HTTP cookie. So now JavaScript with HTTP only is not able to access that uh, your cookies. Uh, same thing with uh, secure, that just basically means um, SSL encryption is used or is required to be used when passing that kind of information. So we want to enable that whenever possible. Uh, the other thing we can do here is on the server side, add some cross-site scripting, scripting protection, which we do by simply setting the header to x-xss-protection to a value of 1, and we set a mode to block, and that way we block cross-site scripting. Uh, and that's again on the server side, it doesn't mean that we're blocking that on the client side, uh, which is where the browser is and such. Uh, the other header we have here is always append X-Frame options, same origin. Um, I think there's a deny value. Uh, I don't remember what they are. Maybe I'll see it on this server here. Let me do this. Inspect element. And we'll see if this one's any different or if I set that one on my own. And uh, we'll refresh. Nagios. And I have, yeah, I have mine set to same origin as well. What about if we go here? Here it's set to deny. So that's, the, so I couldn't remember that. Simple enough, right? Uh, so those are two options. Basically what they're doing is they help prevent clickjacking attacks. And what a clickjacking attack is, is if I have a link on a web page, say, such as this check for updates link here. If I'm an attacker, I could put in an iframe tag uh, that might uh, and put in my own link on top of that. So even though I think I'm clicking this link, there's actually another one on top of that I'm clicking on. And uh, you know, that's what a clickjacking attack is. So I think I'm clicking on one thing and really I'm clicking on another that's invisible and it takes me to a site I don't wanna go to. Um, so we can prevent that by, with our X-Frame options. The other thing I have here set is our HSTS, or Strict Transport Security. We want to set that to on. Um, the correct way to do this is with the preload option as well. Um, and what, However, using that requires forwarding all HTTP requests to HTTPS. And the reason for that is when you first initially access a site, the header information gets put on afterwards. So we're not able to do that initially. So that's why we want to access the HTTP site first in order to use that preload option. Uh, we include subdomains to ensure that this protection gets added onto, um, you know, google.com and gmail.google.com or whatever else there would be. And we can set a max age of two years as the max or one year is fine. Uh, if your certificate is a let's encrypt and certificate and it expires in 90 days you could set that to 90 days if you like and what this does is once this header is on there and your site grabs it for the first time you the certificate name has to match so the and your certificate has to be valid basically and that prevents man in the middle attacks so that people can't perform any kind of uh, SSL stripping to steal passwords or decrypt things um, so that's the importance of the HSTS. However, it can break communication with the website if you have, say, multiple websites hosted on one server and one of them needs HSTS and the other has a different virtual host name, you'd have to set up, uh, set that up a little bit differently and I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, so you'd have to get that information from somewhere else. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, basically, yeah your SSL certificate is going to have to match that one. Otherwise, having two different host names, the HSTS is going to get confused and it's going to be expecting a different site name when you're going to another site. Uh, so that's that part of it. The next thing we can do here that I like to do that's not really required. Um, let's do this is I'm just going to copy and paste the command. So we can generate our uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman parameters. So we can create a 4096-bit Diffie-Hellman uh, key. 
and we can use that in our Apache configuration file where I would modify Etsy Apache 2. Is that in my site? Maybe my default SSL. Um, we'll find out here in a sec. And I have my SSL engine, my SSL certificates, and it looks like not there. Um, so it might just be in my Apache 2 comp file. And I have my limit request, my log format. Let's do, uh, what is it, DH param. All right, I don't want to hold you up anymore on this. So we'll just search grep or uh, not case sensitive and we're looking for dh param from etsy apache 2 yeah oh, it was my ssl comp file i missed it um, so in your mods enabled ssl.conf so that wasn't there yeah we can set that value for our dh or diffie hellman parameters uh, dh dh param and as you can see this is my value here and what I'm doing is basically creating a strong set of Diffie Hellman parameters to use as opposed to just um, whatever defaults the system offers and not to say that the default system ones are not secure we're just extending uh, we're, we're making it more secure i believe by increasing the key size um do, do, so we covered cross-site scripting the cookie click jacking hsts and uh oh yeah so since we're might as well just cover this while we're all here so with OpenSSL, one of the things we're going to do here is we're setting the SSL protocol to version 1.3, TLS version 1.3, which is the newest available. Uh, TLS version 1.2 is still acceptable, uh, so I've enabled that one as well. However, OpenSSL is not compatible with that natively yet. So when we set our, if you're going to use this in Apache, you need to set your SSL cipher suite and then determine the TLS version 1.3, and then you can set your cipher suites after that. Then you would define it again for a TLS version 1.2 by doing SSL cipher suite, SSL, and then defining uh, those values here. Um, I also have a, a configuration file for Apache that you can use, or multiple of these configuration files for Apache you, use, you can use as a template. I'm gonna have a link to that in the description of this video as well. Um, but yeah, so I also have my DH or Diffie Hellman parameters defined here, as well as uh, my elliptic curve algorithms. Um, we turn off, <coughs> SSL compression is turned off, and our SSL options we have set to strict require to ensure that it's required. We're honoring the cipher suite order, which ensures that the strongest cipher suites get used first. And uh, that would be like TLS ES256, that gets used first, then the second one here would get used. And uh, we've disabled insecure renegotiation. And what else do I have up here? Oh, all right, so we'll get to that such, that stuff in a second. Our random seed. Alrighty, so we'll get back to that. The other place we have these defined is Apache 2 sites enabled and then default SSL.conf. And all right, yeah, we're going to get to this now. So uh, with our SSL certificates here, what we're going to do is you can see I have uh, for one, I have my server name defined up here, and this is just basic SSL implementation. I have my server name defined here. I have um, my SSL engine turned on, and I have my SSL certificates defined. Now, the SSL certificate file I have defined here is a Let's Encrypt certificate. Uh, they offer free certificates that are good for 90 days, so it's nice to set up a script that um, basically candles all that for you every 90 days or so. And with this file, it needs to, you need to use the full chain 
.pem file that comes with Let's Encrypt, which includes not just your certificate, but also the intermediate certificate and the root certificate, uh, the root CA certificate for Let's Encrypt or R3 or whatever they want to call that. Um, now, on top of that, the reason I mentioned it is because I also have, as you'll notice, US uh, stapling is enabled. I have that turned on. And what stapling does is perform a query to the o an OCSP query uh, from the server to make sure that your certificate is still good and it has not been revoked. Uh, so in order to do that, we need to define, first we need to turn US, uh, I keep saying US, we need to turn uh, SSL stapling on. We need to define our CA certificate file, which again is the same as that full chain.pem file from Let's Encrypt, which includes all our certificates. And uh, we would need to, at the top here, set our SSL stapling cache outside of the virtual host tags. And this is the RFC number, I believe, 32768. And uh, that ensures that we make our, our requests, basically. Do I have any other options here that are set for that? I don't, let's see, we have our, no. Up top, I think those are all I really needed to set, yeah. We'll just check our SSL comp file in case there's anything there as well. Uh, oh, our session cache is the other thing that you can define for that. So uh, we have our SSL session cache, which is just remembering uh, the value of the revoked certificate information from OCSP. And that's where all that fun stuff is there. Uh, if the certificate is not valid or it has been revoked, that OCSP stapling request is going to uh, prevent communication with the site, which can help with man-in-the-middle attacks um, on the with the client, basically. So we've done that. Another thing to mention that's not really too big of a thing I've noticed anymore is directory traversals. Um, with Apache, it's I can't even set it up natively that way by just like turning off settings. I'd have to use PHP or some other kind of scripting language to force this kind of behavior to happen. Uh, so I'm just going to mention some of the things that you can you used to be able to do, I guess. So you could do a to dismod uh, force auto index, and that's going to prevent the ability to disclose the contents of files. One thing that might happen is if you have a really bad configuration, you might be able to disclose the contents of the HT access file, which can contain passwords. Sometimes it can contain rules so that an attacker can see how to possibly bypass any kind of configurations. Apache suggests not even using the HT access file anymore. They say just put your configurations inside Etsy Apache, apache2.conf and uh, don't use the HT, HT access file. So in order to not use it, we would do Etsy Apache 2 slash apache2.conf. And we notice here we have allow override is set to none, allow override is set to none, allow over. So that's where our, we're blocking the use of HT access. And we can also define the file. I'll probably just do search for it. There we go. Notice I have commented out access file name .ht access, so I'm not using that at all here. Uh, also, another thing that I had to, in order to make that disclosable, you'll notice this files match down here where it says require all denied. So if a file starts with dash .ht access or dash .ht password or whatever, anything with .ht, deny that access. So if I were to do the same kind of request on my local host here, it would be denied. And as you can see, it's denied or forbidding. And uh, the reason for that is this rule here, and that's totally fine. I had to disable that on the other one just to kind of show what a directory traversal, or I should say a local file inclusion uh, does. Um, so in order to prevent local file inclusions, we would need to modify. Uh, typically, it's best to say none here for allow override. However, if you have other options set there that using that you are using, you would do a dash includes and that's or minus. So we're removing that permission. So we would do dash includes uh, dash indexes would be another way as is this one's more for CGI dash bin, but 
uh, minus exec CGI. Did I have that right? Exec. Where's my notes here? Exec. Why can't I remember this one? No, that's right. Exec. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Exec CGI. So you could remove all of those. So exec CGI, if you're not familiar with CGI dash bin, it's commonly known with um, like the, uh, what is that attack called? Well, I can't remember it. I even did a blog article on it. <laughs> but basically the CGI bin allows you to execute commands in any language like bash or PHP or Python or whatever the case may be to make your web server uh, work op uh, optimally or whatever you're using. So if you're not using that, you can remove that ability to use that uh, completely with this or setting your options to none. And uh, yeah, so that's basically HT access. And the other thing I'm checking now <clears throat> to help with uh, DDoS attacks, as you can see, we already have security modules that help with this. However, there are a couple other options you can use as well. So if I go to my limit request body, you can see we can set a limit on the request body size. Uh, there's also limit request fields. We can set that 20 if there's not going to ever be more than 20 request fields. And we can also limit the size of those request fields as well. <clears throat> there's also a max timeout that we can set. <clears throat> what is it? Keep alive? Okay. So we can turn keep alive on, <clears throat> send define our max keep alive requests. It's actually set pretty high at 100. You could set that even lower. I've heard even to single digits. Uh, however, if leaving the defaults, it's not going to hurt anything because we already have our DDoS attack protection on thanks to the evasive module <clears throat> and the security two module. Uh, another thing I'll mention too with those modules is sometimes you'll see people telling you to add the rules for OWASP. And if you're not familiar with, with OWASP, what they are is basically they do research on web vulnerabilities and such. And they have their own web scanner and they have recommended rules. Uh, those are now applied automatically with the Security 2 module or the default custom rules. So you don't have to do that manually anymore as they're already applied. And uh, I believe that looks like all I got for you. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment area. Uh, anything you want to add, I'll, if it's really good, I'll pin it to the top of the comments. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. Please subscribe. That helps me uh, put more work into the videos as well as answer your questions and such. So thanks everyone for watching.